might be pulled towards you and in this moment we we've come we've simply um, showed up and God we is that's pretty much all we can do we'll turn pages we'll think thoughts but father it's you that awaken us uh, that awakens us to the reality of your word it is your spirit that allows us to comprehend and to grasp um, what you're saying and so father we pray tonight that as we've come um, as you tell us to diligently seek your face father would you would you appear? Would you manifest yourself? Would you allow us to, um, to apprehend you, as Paul said, that he had been set on a pursuit to pursue you, to chase you, the one who had chased him? And Father, in this, in this time together, would you uh, fill this study with, uh, with the spirit of worship as we, um, as we reflect on your word, as we seek your face, that you might uh, deepen our, our heart's experience uh, with who you are as you revealed yourself in your word, uh, that we, Father, might have the continual pull as we leave um, to grow, to desire to put you first. As we said last week, that we would sanctify you uh, in our hearts, that we would put you above everything else. Father, would you allow that to deepen uh, even tonight? We lift this time up to you. Uh, we put it in your hands. Uh, would you bless anybody else who is yet on their way? Give them travel mercies, hearts in tune to the spirit. Whenever they arrive, that, Father, we all will be better for having come tonight. So we, uh, we give this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. All right. So um, we are we are on, um, we've been kind of going back and forth a little bit on page 11. And again, we are dealing with the pilgrim's progress, the pursuit of a brother who has been awakened. To the reality, it's on page 11, to the reality of his need for Christ, to the desperate state of his condition, he has been awakened to find out he is dwelling in the city uh, of destruction and that he needs to flee uh, that place. And so as he has been awakened to that, um, he doesn't know which way to go, but uh, he is now beginning to get instructions from the preacher who showed up to begin to point him in the right direction. And so... Let's pick up on the top of page um, 11, and we're going to try to move down to that third paragraph, but I'll begin to read for us just to put context on where we started at. So uh, it says, then uh, said evangelist, uh, why are you not willing to die since this life is attended with so many evils? The man answered, because I fear <coughs> that this burden, uh, which is upon my back, will sink me lower than the grave, and I shall fall into what means basically hell. So this burden, which is sin, is on my back. It's very heavy, and I'm, I'm nervous because if something is not done for my condition, I'm, I'm going to hell. 
And he says, and sir, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit to go to judgment. And from there to execution, and the thoughts of these things make me cry. Then said evangelist, if this is your condition, why are you standing still? So if this is the reality of where you are, that you are in a desperate situation, why are you standing still? He answered, because I know not which way to go. And then it says, then he gave him a parchment roll, and that was written within, flee or fly from the wrath to come. And it says, and the man therefore read it, and looking upon the evangelist very carefully, said, where must I fly? Then evangelist, pointing his finger over a very wide field, said, do you see um, yonder wicked gate? The man said, no. Then said the other, do you see the shining light? And he says, I think I do. Then said evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go directly there where it's pointing you. So you shall see the gate at which when you knock, it shall be told uh, what you shall do. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door when his wife and children perceiving it began to cry after him to return. But the man put his finger in his ears and ran on crying, life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. Okay, so somebody right quick, give me a little recap. Of what, what do we see going on so far in the, in the story? What is happening so far? Sis, good to see you. Uh, that one right there, the, um, page 11. We're going to get to that one, but the main one, Pilgrim's Progress, that one, page 11, we're on the t uh, page 11. So, so what's happening so far in the story that we see? Because he know where to go. I know I got to run. I can't stay here. But um, something ha somebody got to show me which way to go. So turn right quick to Hebrews uh, 9, 27. Let's just get the context of what. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27. Okay, if somebody would mind reading that for us once we all get there, Hebrews chapter 9. Pick up another one. Hebrews is towards the back, so you would get, um, you get, uh, and that, yeah, I think she got her own Bible, though. So you would come after uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Yeah, it's, it's on the way to the back. It's before James, right before James. Yeah, right before James. <clears throat> so Hebrews chapter 9, um, we're considering verse 27. Let's stop right there. So basically, that says that Everybody is appointed to die. Like, there's no escape from that. And then after that, there's a judgment. So he finds out, if that's the case, and if I come to God as I stand, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. He's certain. So what does it take?
for you to be able to recognize that, because we've all heard, I mean, there's a sense of doing wrong, and I know I'm doing wrong, but what does it take to get what he got right now? Because he, he got like, I am awakened. I'll leave anybody. I'll cut on you so quick right now. Like, he is, he is ready to move based on that fear. What does that take to bring a person to that? Okay. <laughs> you see, it's true condition. The, the, the scales is are like, you know, you can have a mirage if you compare yourself with other people. Why well, ain't that bad? But, like, he see himself in relationship to God. Like, because, again, remember what happened was he had been reading the Bible. He said, this book... He said, how did you know you were Troy? He said, this book I've been reading, like, is telling me, like, I am in bad shape. Me, not my brother, my cousin, my uncle, like, none of them, like, me. I'm standing in the, like, I need something to be done. I don't know what to do. That's a, that's a blessing. Yep. <laughs> right. Been around it, but yeah. Right. You're getting lumped in <laughs> and, and don't even know it. Right. Right. Guilty by association. That's real talk. form. Right. I ain't that bad. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so It's automatic, like you said. And so this is why I, um, like, really aggressively go after that aspect of we don't make a decision for Christ. God makes a decision for us. He, he commands the light to shine into the darkness so that I can actually see my circumstance. Because before, listen to this, the byproduct of the sinful nature is self-deception. I'm not that bad. No, not me. Like, that, that's, it's already innate for me to fool myself, even if, when people, like, think about this. Like, I remember when I was on, in, in college, on campus, knowing I grew up around the church, grandmom and then, boy, you need Jesus, all of that. Here I am doing the fool, and people would talk to me about Jesus, and, you know, 
I was just like, you know, I would tell them in their face I was still a nice guy. Like, yeah, I might come through. I might come to the Bible study. But I know as soon as I ain't thinking about no Bible study. But it had to take a transformation of the heart for me to know, like, man, I need Christ. Like, not my grandmama. Like, that ain't for old folks. I wait till I get older. Like, I need him right now. Like, and that right there is a gift. Because that is God saying, I'm not going to leave you to yourself. Because we are all born blind. We don't see that we need God. I don't feel that I need God. Like there's no desperation, but it's God who puts desperation in us by turning the lights on. Like so, so, so. Let's grab one quick scripture that we uh, we started on last week. We didn't even we we went somewhere else. But go Second Corinthians chapter four. Um, just as a, a way to get this brother right now, though he is filling Second Corinthians chapter four. We we'll start maybe verse one. Um, but though he feels like he's on dangerous ground, he has to recognize that that is a gift that God has even um, come to tell you where you are. That he's not leaving you in this foolish state to think that you can, listen to this, make it without him. I actually thought I didn't need God. I thought that that was for other folks or they doing too much or like I thought all kind of other stuff just because that's what my own mind can see. But when he awakened me, all that changed. Like, it, they used to have to make me go to church. But when the lights came on, I was on my way by myself. Like, whether they was coming or not. But so God has to listen to this, make it personal. See, because he wants us to come after him. Like, like, do you see me now? And, and do you see where you are? And now to begin the journey of, like, I got to get out of this. this I can't stay. Because, remember, that's where this cat is. He like, I don't know which way to run, but I'm ready to run at any second. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4. And let's just start at verse number 3. It says that if, if our gospel is veiled or hidden, then it is because, listen to this, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. So think about that, first of all. Everybody who cannot see the truth of who Christ is and how desperately they need him, they are already perishing. They, they food on the counter, spoiled, and if it, it's you you're in trouble. Like, and so he says, if you can't see this truth, that means you already in bad shape. Not like it's gonna be bad, like you already in the, you're not in a saved condition. Because to be saved, as we said before, you gotta put me in the refrigerator. Else I'm gonna spoil. And so here is God saying, listen to this, if it's veiled, it's because you are perishing. And he says this, and this is the case for them. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds uh, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. How? How has he blinded people's minds? What does he do to blind people? benefit me. I'm at the center.
just, just, yeah. Right, right, right. People just want to have a good time. <laughs> right. Shouldn't, yeah, this is not the place to be. Right. And don't even know it. Right. Right. Got my drink in my hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm, f- right. So in that case, like, to be trapped in that type of situation, you need to be delivered out of that. Like, somebody has to rescue you that sees the condition, has the ability to go in and make it out with you. That's what Jesus did. He knows where we are without him. And so he has broken in and come to rescue us. That's a scary thing. And so that's why we should be spending our time in pursuit of people. Because at the end of the day, I know it's up to God's choice ultimately. Like, he has to open their eyes. But my thing is, I don't know when he might do it. And I don't know who he's going to do it on. So he probably tell me, tell everybody. And continue to tell them. Like, because they may not got said last week. It may not happen on the 78th time, but that 79th time is the time when they finally going to see it and their life condition will be in the right posture to be like, I do need something different. And now I'm really ready to hear you. So we should be folks who, as we said last week as well, if I know the cure for cancer, why am I going to keep that to myself? And there's people dying of cancer all around me. Like, I should be going out of my way to make sure, like, man, you got it. And so remember even, like, like, if they say you're doing too much, like I'm the, you don't need like I might not be doing enough right now because this situation is critical. And so we said last week as well, just right quick, that we spend too little time preaching. When all of us are to be a witness, a minister, a declarer of who Christ is and what he's done for us. And so again, that should be the position we're in because people are living where he's standing now. And they don't even know it. They in the burning building, and you don't even have much time left and don't even recognize that. But you just try to have fun. I'm just, I'm chilling. Right, you, and you, they looking at you like you trying to ruin, you ruin my mood right now. I don't want to hear all that. So, again, we have to be people who pray for ways to say it that can meet them where they are. And then at the same time, I'm praying that God will open their eyes so that they can hear what's being said. Like, that's key. Say it again. Yeah. Like, that, that's, <clears throat> like, this is what being a disciple is. The commandment for us is to go and make disciples. And what is a disciple? Follower, student, a learner, somebody who is after Christ. And so he says that this is what you are. Like, go make this. Like, that's our charge. In whatever way, and again, I don't mean that you got to know every scripture in the Bible, but what you do know, you better open your mouth and get to talking about something because people are in a desperate condition, okay?
Yeah, yeah. Now nah, we need. Right. <laughs> right. 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 God could do what the amber lambs can't do. Like, because again, you're in a situation where, like, you are in that place that God has to move, or else you're stuck. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. You're doing too much. So that's on us to, uh, to be a witness, to be a faithful witness. So let's continue this verse right quick. Um, so he says, if our gospel is veiled, rereading verse 3, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then he says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light, to give the light, to give the light of the knowledge. So basically, he wants us to, he shines light on something that we can know. There's some facts about Christ. There's some details about his life, the events of what he did, who he did it for. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So God reveals who he is as we behold Christ in his saving work on the cross for us. And so think about this. He goes to this image of, what does verse 6 remind you of when he says, for God who said, uh, who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts. What does that remind you of? What image does that go back to? Well, let there be light. So this is a creatorial work. God who spoke when there was nothing but darkness said, let there be light. And the Bible says, and there was light. This is how people come into the seeing of who Christ is, not as they think he is, but as he actually is in the reality of God's presence. Like God has to command light to shine for that individual person to take the words of Christ and they begin to make sense. I said before that when the lights came on, without a full understanding of the Bible, but as I begin to read it, it began to make sense. And I had, like, been to school or none of that for the Bible. It was just like, but it was like, I could see that. I can understand that. Like, that matters to me now. It was because the lights was on. So that wasn't because I got smarter. That wasn't because I was more focused on Christ. It was God who was enabling me to not see him in my blinded state and make, try to make sense of him in my own mind, but he was giving me vision. And now Christ was different, and so this is the gift. So if you are in that category, like, you got to recognize, man, it's a blessing. God is on my side. He has not left me with the blinded eyes. It's a lot of people who got blinded eyes about Jesus. The whole world would be, if, if God don't move, the world is, is left in blindness. Because listen, we're born blind. But it's God who has to do that. I mean, it's been, I mean, it's been that since after Adam and Eve, like, the next kid born was, it's, it's automatic, and that's been repetitious, like, and we've gotten more, more wicked, more evil, more further and further away from God, all of that. Just think about this. <clears throat> when you start looking at the United States, back in um, maybe 50s, uh, late 50s, um, television just didn't let you do too much on TV. In terms of stuff like, you know, they got Elvis Presley on TV when he did this right here. They're like, you can't put that on TV. 
But look at now. All of a sudden. And they got access to all of that right at their fingertips. Right? So again, just like over time, sin has become, listen to this, more normal. It's, it's, it's just, it's not even wild to see some of the stuff we see. Like, that is where stuff is headed. So God has to, to move to awaken a person to even see that. Listen to this. That's not normal. That's not the way it should be. Like, and, and listen to this. We got to go into a fight against those things because this is where God is calling. He wants us to be different. We should look different. Like, it should be a distinguishing mark of difference between your life and the person who's blind. If your life look exactly like their life and you're supposed to be able to see, and it's like, well, so, well what do you see? <laughs> Who do you see? If you say you can see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You can cast that off. put them on, on blast. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. No. Because think about what, is, what did Jesus say the Holy Spirit's job was in John 15. So what, what did he say the Holy Spirit's job would be? Comforter, counselor, that he will guide you into all things concerning me. Right? Like he has a job. Now, a conviction of sin is part of that. It's to bring me to the realization of what he got brought to. Like, I need an escape route. Because think about this. If... <clears throat> If I n never understand that I'm guilty, then there's no desperation for me to be forgiven for something like I need, I need forgiveness. So that has to be a part of it. And this, all of that comes to head when we look at Christ on the cross. Because the question is, well, why is he up there? Because remember, even the guy on the cross said, this guy is innocent. He, he ain't done nothing wrong. Like he hung up between two cats who are actually guilty. Like, let me just back up one step. So you remember um, right before as Jesus was going through the torment stuff to get ready to get sent to the cross, um, there was a custom that every year during this Passover time that the, the, the Roman emperor, whoever he was, would give one of those prisoners a pass of freedom. And so he looking for a escape route because he knew Jesus wasn't guilty, but these people want to get rid of him so bad, and they about to start a mob fight up in this thing, and he like, well, the cat above me going to be like, well, what's going on in your town? You ain't running stuff right because people fighting. So he trying to find a way out of it. He says, well, listen, well, I know this cat that's down here. They don't want me to let him out. This cat named Barabbas, he been, he been making a mess. So I'm a, this is what I'm going to do because I know they're going to say, well, no, we don't want Barabbas. I'll let Jesus go then. So he tried to say, well, bring Barabbas. Now, who do y'all want to go free, Jesus or Barabbas? They like, let Barabbas go. Get this guy out the way. So here is the picture of us. The worst criminal in the prison goes free. Jesus, who is, who is innocent, goes guilty. Like, that is the picture of our salvation. 
But listen to this. Imagine, and the Bible doesn't go into detail of what happened after that moment, but you have to begin to recognize, like, well, what did God do with that? Like, this cat who just, like, he don't know, like, how did I get out? Like, I know I was supposed to be locked in there forever, and here I am free now. Like, that has to be a witness of, like, man, God is good. Like, something, something happened. Somebody traded places with me. Who was that guy that went in for me? And for him to begin to hear the story of who he was, and, and why did they put him in, though? That don't match up, in that, but they let me go. The charges that are against us in God's courtroom are true charges. We are all guilty of sin, and the main sin is we prefer other stuff above God. Now, you might have preferred different stuff than what I prefer, but the whole matter of sin is you chose something over God, the creator, the one who made us for himself. And we said, nah, I'd rather have that, her, him, whatever that stuff is, and went after that. That's the sin right there. Forget what we did. The root of sin is turning from him to something else, whatever that is. And so for God to forgive us for that, and think about this, the one who demands the payment for sin comes down off of his throne to say, I will pay your penalty. That's, see, that'll make you worship right there. You don't take that lightly in the sense of, like, that was a costly forgiveness. The one who had the right to punish me for my guilt came and took my place and received my guilt to triumph over it. That's, that's good news. Turn right quick to John 9 right quick. Yeah, and that. I see it. Eyes open. What the other guy did. So, <clears throat> turn right quick to John chapter 9. Um, all right, let's go verse 1. John 9, verse number 1. Uh, number 1. Let's start at verse number 1. John chapter 9, verse number 1. And if somebody would mind beginning to read, we'll go down a little bit, but uh, we'll get this story. So John 9, starting at verse number 1. Stop for one second. That's G, that's red letters right there. Now look at what, like, look at, look at the conversation about the guilt that is on this brother. In terms of that's what this blindness represents. Like, he can't see. And listen to this, he was born that way. So they're trying to find out, well, what's the root cause of that? The root cause is so that the work of God would de be displayed. Here is God in his sovereign wisdom, right? <clears throat> knowing that we are all born in trespasses and sins, but here is where God stands. The Bible says that he has chosen himself a people and put them in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. He has a people in Christ, hidden in Christ, before the foundation of the world. And the Bible says he knows them by name. He knows the hairs on their head like he ordains the time frame that they'll be born in. So he is not, listen to this, this is why I believe God is not anxious at all right now. He's not worried about, oh, man, they still running away from me, all of that. Because he know all it takes for him is light. Light. And when the light, like, I can finally see, he like, that's all. So he's not panicking. He is at rest on his throne, knowing that the Holy Spirit will be doing his job in the earth, calling people out of sin and into salvation. So he's going through this journey, putting on display this whole action. He's like, listen, this ain't about his mama, daddy, none of that. This situation he's in is so that the work of God will be displayed. Your journey, wherever you found yourself, wherever sin took you, had been factored into the plan and the will of God so that you would go and whatever, however your personality has been shaped, your character, your journey, your story, your testimony, it's all been factored in so that it could be used to display 
the glory of God. Because then the question will be, well, how did he, where, where, where did he get you from? And, and how, so think about this. So listen, there's no wasted moments in your journey. The good days, the bad days, the stuff that was working, the stuff that didn't work, like all of that. Like listen to this. He, he has a plan and it won't fail. That is great news and that at any moment, like stuff that we go through, the Bible talks about, remember we read a scripture before about um, comfort those with the comfort that you've been comforted with, which means God lets you go through some difficult stuff in different seasons of your life, and he stepped into your situation and comforted you through that situation. So as you encounter somebody else in life up the road, your testimony is what God did for you when you were in one of those situations and point them towards a God who is not that you heard about, not the God you read in the Bible, but the God who showed up in your life. That's the best witness. I'm talking about what I know. I ain't talking about what I heard. I, I'm talking about what I've experienced with God. And so that's what God wants to bring us to. So this is, like, this is where we should be then. Don't panic. Don't, don't panic as you find yourself in different seasons. Don't, don't panic. Let let the unknown scenarios drive you to the God who knows everything. I should go to him, and then I should go and pray for the faith that I need to deal with this because you're not scratching your head, God, trying to figure out why this happened to me. You already knew what was going to happen before it happened, and you got a game plan, and you are actually going to use this for your glory and for my good. Like, all of that comes together. So, so, so just, just notice that right quick. The man was blind from birth. <clears throat> they tried to figure out what happened. And then he says, it was neither this man his sin or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Go ahead and pick up the fourth verse. In verse 4. So stop for a second. What, what is he saying? Because, again, he's, he's in the posture that he wants us to be in, to follow after him as a disciple maker. So what is he saying as he says it's, it's not about sin. It's about the display of the glory and the work of God. And night is, you know, on the way. And no man can work when it's nighttime, so let's work while it's day. What is, he, what is Jesus getting after? Because, remember, he's an example. Right. Clock struck. Right. 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 Yeah. Good. Progressive. Yeah. And opens. Right. I didn't know I was go I didn't know I was gonna turn to it either. So again, that's, that's God's wisdom. So again, when you look at that, part of what Jesus is saying to his disciples who would now have to follow after him as he's called us to be witnesses is stop getting hung up on the wrong details. As you survey people's lives, you own the wrong details. Sin ain't no problem for me. I done already conquered sin at the grave. So let's not start pointing out, because then you get in the conversation, no, it was his mama, no, it was his daddy, and then what happened, and what who did they, you looking at the wrong, he would, listen, he was, the cat was born that way, so that God would use his life as a witness for something else. So let's get on the main emphasis, this is about God opening blinded eyes, stop talking about his mama, and talking about, talking about what he did, because listen to this, in the blind state where God is saying, you can't help but go wrong. You're walking in life blind. You don't know what you're bumping into and all. So you're like, this is, he can't help but go the wrong way. But watch what I'm able to do. So Jesus is setting up something as a witness. This is key. Did you have your hand up?
Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, 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 what you doing? What Letting stuff happen. Right. Yeah. Right. Get on your grizzly. Yeah. That's big. Yeah, there's a plan. Yeah, get up. Get up. So think about this. What 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 she just said, what the scriptures illustrate, what Jesus is trying to get us in a position to think like, is that no matter where you find yourself, you are never defeated. Like, just think about the posture of a person who just keep getting up. Think about this. This had resonated in the Apostle Paul. Because think about this cat would get whooped for talking about Jesus to these folks. That cat would get up, dust itself off, and go to the next city and say the exact same thing. Like that is, that is a picture of like, listen to this, I might be down, but I ain't out. Because listen to this, God is doing something, and now that I know that he can use whatever, think about this. God tells them cats, go into that city, go into the marketplace, like go downtown where everybody at and start preaching about Jesus. And they ain't never heard about this. This is like foreign stuff. What are you talking about? And they throw them cats in jail. Now, first they whoop them and then let them go and say, don't do it again. A grown man get whooped for preaching in the, in the, cent, in the city center. And then they get out of the, the whooping situation and go back to the same spot telling them about Jesus. And they come and get them and take them to jail. At that point, you should be having a rough conversation with God. God, why did you let this happen? You told us to do it. Bad stuff is happening. But that wasn't even their conversation. The Bible says they was down there praising and praying. And God showed up so that the jailer could get saved. Like, that's a posture of it don't matter where he send me, I'm going to stay on my ground. The Bible says I will bless the Lord at all times. That means you must have seen him. You must have been made to see his goodness that no circumstance can overshadow who he is. Think about this. God is bigger than our circumstances. Our circumstances feel big to us because they're, 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 we, we underneath them and we feel powerless to change them. And God has to, so hold our place right there. Hold our place right there. Go, um, go back to 2 Corinthians right quick. Um, we're going to go back to John, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God wants to know, let us know that there's an invincible principle at work in us. And that invincible principle is the glory of his name displayed through our lives. He is making a testimony about himself in our lives, and every plan, every purpose he has preordained for you to fulfill, it will be fulfilled. So what we got to do then is I need help so you can show me what my real purposes are. Because sometimes I'm wasting time trying to do stuff that ain't what you told me to do, and I'm trying to pray to help you, make, make you fix that. And he like, I ain't going to ever fix that. I'm actually the one messing that up so you can, so you can leave that alone because I, I, got, I got some other stuff I need you to do. So, so that's so our prayers would change when we really come into the know of who God is and the fact that he has a purpose. He has a lane I'm supposed to be in. Why is you getting out of your lane? Remember we were talking last week, somebody else doing something, you look at what they do. I want to do that. No, you go do what I told you to do. I already got him doing that. 
So we need to we need to we need to pursue God in a way of desperate prayer. Show me your will for my life. Because it's daytime right now, but night is coming. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to come into glory empty-handed. I don't want to come in your presence not having lived up to the purposes and the plans. I want to do what you've called me to do. So look at um, verse number 7. I'll read for us. It says in verse 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 7. Look what he says. He's trying to encourage them. And remember, he's writing these letters from jail. He says, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So just stop for one second. If you are going to be a real Christian living out your purpose, everybody not going to like you. Everybody not going to receive you. And so one of the things that we do is we tone tone it down or we turn our volume down because we're trying to get light. But think about this. If we take that image of it's daytime right now, but night is coming, and you don't know when night is coming, and like the clock is ticking, why are you posturing yourself, worrying about somebody else when it's like, man, you got to be doing what I told you to do now. Remember, we read the resolutions thing as we came out of um, into January, and uh, one of the resolutions of a 19-year-old cat in back in the 1600s that had really committed his life to God, he said this. He said, never to be found doing something that I wouldn't want to be found doing if I was made to know that this is the last hour of your life. That's pressure on life. That's pressure. Like, I'm living in a way that if this could be my last hour, I'm living in that reality. I don't know when he's going to call my name. So I don't ever want to be found doing something that I wouldn't want to be doing if I was finna go stand before him right now. That'll help you live right. <laughs> that, that'll help you live right. <laughs> Amen. Right. Right. Let me out. Mm. That way. Get that way. Yes. Waste. Because I'm on your time. I'm on your schedule. Everybody. Yep. Yep. But also the illusions of what what's really going on in your life. Right. And whether or not you know how important it is. Yes. You know, all the things we have discussed. Yeah. Right. In the moment it fit because see here's what happens. If I'm not beholding a fresh image of Christ, listen to this, on a day-to-day basis. Most people live with Christ in a rearview mirror. Like, okay, yeah, I did the Jesus thing on Sunday. It's Wednesday. You know, I'm just living right now. I'll get back to Jesus in the front on Sunday. And so if we don't live day-to-day with a fresh vision of, like, lead the way, I'm looking to you, Christ, to tell me what today should be, how do I conduct myself during this day, we get into this place to where as moments happen, My, my devotion is rivaled for other things, and things sometimes that are natural tendencies. So that's why we have to um, watch ourselves. We have to be wise over our lives, because I got the infidel in me. That Larry, that's like, he's still in there. He's like, I know you're doing the Jesus thing, but he's just waiting in the cuts. <laughs> he's waiting in the cuts just if you, if, if you just put that guard down a little bit, and next thing y'all know, I'm back. And so he is, so listen, like that is, that is the reality of our journey. Listen to this, till the end. You're not going to get rid of that other you. The thing is that that person would be subdued. 
Bible tells us to reckon yourselves dead to sin. So that that way sin doesn't reign or have control in this body that you live your life out of. But Christ has control. Think about this. Your own person to tell you, take yourself over there. Because those are the things, and it's set up, and it's looking, it's, but, but, and so, you know, it's crazy how sometimes we do this with natural folks. You know you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, and somebody asks you about it, and you say, huh? <laughs> you know you heard exactly what they just said to you. Huh? But we have a way of not talking to ourselves or preaching to ourselves in that moment because so we can't leave Jesus at Bible study on Wednesday. We can't leave him at Sunday service. We need him to walk with us day by day because that's what begins to help my life change to look like I've seen him. Okay. So we're going to read this, but I need you to hold your place one more time. Go to Titus chapter 1. So we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians, but go to Titus. So Titus is, um, if you just, it's right before, two, a book before a Hebrew. So you got Philemon, <laughs> we, we, the books that, you know, chapter 1. Yeah, so Titus, it's in, the, it's in the new. So yeah, go Hebrews, Philemon, Titus. So it's, it's towards the back. Yeah. Yeah, so Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'll wait for everybody to get there because I want to make sure we see, see this verse. So Titus chapter 1. Stay in the light. Right. Yeah. That's a big statement. I want to say one thing on that, but I want to get this point. Um, so Titus 1, verse 16. If somebody wouldn't mind reading that for us, please. Titus 1, verse 16. That's a cold shot. They, they profess that they know him, but by their actions, they actually deny that they know him. Yeah. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. I remember, I remember old school, uh, when I used to go to my grandmother's church, boy, that boy used to preach and walk, walk on the pews while he was preaching. But he used to say this, it ain't how high you jump, but how straight you walk when you come down. So he like, that's fine. You can jump and shout in here all day long if you want to. But what do you do when you stop shouting and you go to living life? And so I think that is what God is after. He is actually after a transformed people. The Bible says that we are transformed as we behold the glory of Christ. What happens is we don't stare at him long enough. We don't stare at him deeply enough. Like, we don't analyze. Like, so, so you have in this little packet right here, you have a, a picture. And um, in my mind, sometimes I think about, um, <clears throat> like, the good times picture. Y'all remember the good times picture? There's a lot of people dancing over here. They got drinks over here. They play a pool over here. Right. But check this out. So, so the thing that happened to give you a full picture of that, that it even be locked in our minds today, is that we analyzed the picture. We looked at the details. We looked at the places and the things. and the, we, look, we, we paid attention. That's how our lives should be as we look in the Word. Like, we should be in the Word analyzing Jesus. Like, like there should be no book in the Bible foreign to us. Like, there should be no book that, not that I need to know it all, Right, but there should be no, like, I should be contemplating, I should be pouring, or like, my life is found in the Word. And so why do I live as if my mouth, or my, I'm sorry, my life is in somebody else's mouth, meaning I just listen to the preacher. 
or I listen to the music. No, I need to know for me, because some it's gonna be some moments where the preacher ain't around. And I need some stuff in my own heart that I have had God open up for me that when I'm in them tough moments, the word of God can speak to me by the witness of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 I'll let you go on one second. What if that is the person that he needed you to have that, like, I need them to take your clothes, do that, so when you do see them, because I want you to witness to them. Like, I want the encounter, but that's why it's, it's so important that we, we walk in the spirit. It's the challenge, but here's the other thing on that, though. <clears throat> it's not in the Bible of, you know, not to say that when people do that with your clothes. Like, that ain't a scripture. Like, it's stuff that points to that, but that's personal. Like, God spoke to your heart about, that's relationship, man. Like, that's, that's a blessing, man. Right. Everything. That's big. That's big. Right. It just, it just overcame. Like, it's a natural feeling. Right, right, right. Right. Wow. I'm not going to move. Amen. What's up now? Yeah. 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 Pops, what's up with you, man? Good to see you, man. What's up, sis? How you doing? I'm all right. Good to see you. <laughs> right, 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 right. Right. Oh. <laughs> right, right. One. 
Yeah. Yeah, automatic. Yeah. Right. I said, you need to learn this. Right, 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 right. You need to go there. Right. From that, I went. Yeah, it went back. It went back. It went back. Right. right. <laughs> right. Just like you. <laughs> right, right. Automatic. It, it, it wasn't even time for. Right. So, so here is why. I'm gonna let you go in one second. Here is why prayer in the morning, like seeking God's face in the morning, to help you on your day, because you don't know, you don't know the moments you're gonna encounter. You don't know the situations that's gonna happen in your day. Because listen to this. What if? Example, hypothetical. But here's what if God is saying. I need you to. Be, I don't need you to leave earlier than when you're gonna leave. Because if you leave, something else is gonna happen. Like you may accident. Like I am. I am undoing the time frame of something negative happening. You in a rush. And I'm trying to save you. And so, so you have to check this out. The Bible says, all things work together. So I have to recognize. Like, well, maybe God trying to do something. Maybe somebody finna come in here in a few minutes that I'm gonna be sitting next to who gonna need. I need to talk to him. Like I have. No, so I have to let. Check this out. I'm on your time, God. Where our schedules loosely. It's okay, plan, do all of that, but don't be tied to I got like so panicked about stuff that like, well, that ain't really that important. Like if your day is set and given over to me, like I'm surrendering myself to you today, God. Like my day is your day. What what do you I got some plans, but again, you are free to interrupt and reschedule some stuff at listen to this, at my discomfort. Like at, at, at like it might cost I, I remember and this is, um, <clears throat> me and my wife was in a, in, a, in a moment where, you know, we were so busy and stuff was happening where we weren't really spending good time together. We was, she was doing her thing, I was going to do my thing, and, you know, it was almost roommate style, right? <clears throat> so what happened was, <clears throat> something happened with my, my car, and it, it wasn't working right. It was just, it just kind of came out of nowhere, which meant now we got one car, y'all ride together, <laughs> y'all talk. Drop her off, go pick her up, like, but it just got, and so it took a moment for me to see that, because I was mad, and, like, I'm trying to spend money I don't got to get my car fixed now, because I can't be without my car, but God, like, do you see what I'm trying to do? Y'all laughing and dates and hanging out, and in a couple weeks later, my car was fixed, had the money out, and it's just, but God has to help us to see what he's doing, and not be so focused on what we trying to do, or what what changes we got to get put through. Think about this. Jesus got put through changes for us. Discomfort? Like, I, like man, I got to go through this for y'all, and y'all don't even want me. And so, again, we have to be put in that place to be like, my life is yours, God. Every second, every moment, every, like, you have the ability to change where I was headed today. Like, there may be moments where you just need to go hang out with somebody. And that's not the thing that you feel like doing because, man, I'm going to go do this today. And they going to, and you're like, no, I need to go see your auntie. This, and it ain't no big thing today. Like, y'all ain't going nowhere, no big event. Just go sit over there with her. 
because what's, what's going to happen to get told to you once y'all get in the conversation, but be willing to put your thing aside for him. This is what part of the life of following Christ is. Sanctification is this being set apart, set aside for God's use. Like to really have, say, God, take my life. Like that's a dangerous prayer. Say, God, help me to surrender to your will. Because you know what? He'll start shutting stuff off. He'll start, he, he, he will corner you in so that he can bring you to a place to fulfill his will. Like that's a dangerous prayer. That's a costly prayer. It'll put you in some tough moments but you will be so satisfied and content and happy because you know what? You will be doing what the Lord wants you to do. It's, not, it's no place better than that. I saw a hand here, and then i get you next. Go ahead. Yeah. You see, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I ain't got to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Now think about that word you just said right quick. That, that word, me, right? <clears throat> the Bible declares that, um, that Moses was one of the meekest men um, in his time frame. Now think about this. <clears throat> Moses, in his lashing out moment, seeing the needs of his people, killed somebody, killed an Egyptian to save one of his people, which wasn't what God, like that ain't how deliverance is going to happen. Like you're not going to fight everybody to free everybody. Like, so again, in his natural context, he tried to do something to make it happen. So what God did is take him to the backside of the mountain to kind of temper him and um, get him under control. Because think of this, what meekness is, is strength under control. Like, I got power. Because, again, he was the same cat that went to, uh, to the Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. Like, he went bold. Like, he had that in him. He didn't have to be, like, soft. And Some people think meek is soft and quiet. I don't say nothing. But I'm under control, and I only say what God want me to say when he want me to say it. I'm letting God lead that. Like, I'm not doing all that on my own strength. I'm not just trying to make something happen. I'm letting God do it. So I think that's key, that we keep things under control. Sis, could you go check on quick? Can you check on us on me, please? to live in that reality wherever you are whatever circumstances you encounter like that's that's tough right like that what that takes is surrender and it takes the power of the holy spirit to keep me 
under his submission that God, even in this moment with all of my feelings fluttering right now, I feel it at the bottom of my soul right now. I'm upset or whatever. Like I feel it, but that is where the spiritual maturity kicks in that takes me to a place I need to seek his face right now. I need to pray right now. Because I know this, I know, I, see, if you don't recognize the old you, 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 you'll do the fool on God. And the, the question will be, man, I thought you was, I thought you was, right, right. Catch you to tell me, catch you to tell me, man, I'm going to lay my Holy Ghost down if you, if you keep messing with me. But again, like God says, really? Really? Like, okay, that's, that's where you at with it? You still you. You still you. Yeah. How did that sneak on me? Like, yeah. It goes back to what Coach was saying, abiding. To abide means to dwell. I'm going to get you in one second. To abide means to dwell, to live in. Like live under the shadow of the Almighty. Like I need to see him in control. I need to see him bigger than every moment I, I encounter. Because then I don't have to act a fool as if, because what I'm doing is defending my space. I'm defending my, you don't treat me like that. Like you ain't finna jump in front of me. But then check this out. The thing is, God said it ain't all about you. Like, I already did something to put myself at the center, and so now you should be, check this out, you should be willing to let somebody else, because that may give you, check this out, that may give you room to talk for the Lord. Now, it's no telling, but again, it gives you space so that God can now, like, open the door. Like, oh, you're so nice. Thank you, sis. Like, because then now you, you, you actually was before me. I didn't know, but, you know, but all kind of stuff can come out of there, but nothing can come out of the other thing. <laughs> But now an apology, and now you want to tell him about the Lord. You, you tell him about the Lord now, and it's kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 I didn't, I, I had no idea. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea you, I would never put the two together. Like, you, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Staying right there. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you'll, you'll, you'll be all right. Right, right, right. Right, right. right. <laughs> If we could skip over that word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Because what does that take, though? Right, 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 right. So what does that take to be willing? It takes surrender. And, yeah, because it takes, because what, what else does it take, though? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. <laughs> But check this out, though. So surrender, surrender comes from love. Because remember, he says, if you love me, 
you'll keep my commandments.